friends, let's find our way back to our seats, and uh, good to see you connect with one another. I'm grateful that you're doing that. I was enjoying that, too, because I haven't seen you in two weeks, so I'm glad you're here this morning. Um, I hope you enjoyed the week last week of being off. It's uh, My wife was like, in the morning, she's like, oh, you missing church? I'm like, yes. And then she looks at me, she's like, are you being honest with me? You know, I'm like, yes, I, I totally miss church. I understand it's a little stressful giving sermons, but the nice thing is this thing's been marinating for two weeks now, so it should be good, all right? Or maybe that means it went way off. I don't know. You'll have to judge for yourself at the very end. Uh, my name is Darren. I serve in the lead team here. I'm grateful that we get a chance to gather and worship. This truly is a highlight of my week. And if you are new this morning, I want to give you a special welcome and say thanks for joining us here at Imprint. Um, snowy weather and all that kind of stuff. I'm glad some of you made it out. I was out in Echo Lakes uh, kind of area yesterday. I was like, man, people out there, if you live out there, you still need four-wheel drive. So that's pretty impressive that you're out, out and about. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, let's turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Genesis chapter 12. If you don't, we have the words behind us on the screen as well. But you've jumped into our series in the book of Genesis called The Story of God. And today you've jumped into kind of a highlight of the Story of God series, as that we are going to jump into one of the main characters of this book. And we'll be talking about him for the next several weeks, and I'm excited about that. If I were to ask you a question while you're turning in Genesis to chapter 12, if I was to ask you to name one or two of the most important figures of all of history, I wonder what you'd say to me, all right? I wonder what you'd bring up and just say, oh, here's one of the most important figures in all of history. You'd probably say Jesus, right? That's probably that's the church answer, always Jesus, if you will. Because even if you're not a Christian here this morning, Jesus has made a remarkable influence on countless millions of people around the world. So Jesus probably makes that list. But I wonder who else makes the list for you. Maybe people that you can think of that made some sort of significant contribution to society. Maybe you don't even agree with them, but they've made some sort of contribution to society. People that you might say, well, what about someone like Mother Teresa or Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. or someone that has made significant strides in our world? Let me ask you this. What about Abraham the Patriarch? Would he have made your list this morning of people, of the most important people in all of history? It's arguable, friends, that he is literally one of the most important people in all of human history. It's hard to overestimate his significance. Because think about this. Three major faiths or religion in the world, which together, for more, together account for more than half of the world's population, look back to Abraham as their father or a prophet, as their spiritual father, over half of the world, if you think about that. And what's crazy about that is we too, as Christians, if you're a Christian in here, look back to Abraham as the father, one of the fathers of our faith. And it's an amazing thing to think about the importance that he has for us, even today, weirdly enough, sitting here years later in Woodenville, Washington, and Imprint Church, of the significance that he made in our lives as believers and in the world. The story of Abraham is really the story of all of God's true children. Because Abraham is our spiritual father. You know that? It's an argument that shows up all throughout the New Testament. Interestingly enough, in Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, in verses 7 through 9, says this, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. Abraham plays a pretty important part in the Christian faith. After all, it says here that we are the sons, and I would add, and the daughters of Abraham. If you're a Christian in here this morning. Moreover, Paul calls him the father of all believers in Romans chapter 4, verse 11. So there's something important about him and knowing about his history as a church community. So do you know his story? It's a pretty good one. It's pretty compelling. It has ups and downs, and it certainly will surprise you at times if you've never read it before. People always want to start Abraham's story as I had you turn in Genesis chapter 12, when he's actually named Abram. But I think you need to go all the way back to Genesis 11, a whole one chapter beforehand, and the Tower of Babel to know the history of where he came from. After all, doesn't knowing a history of a person helps us understand a little bit more of who they are? Like, for example, if you find out I'm from the Seattle area, my sarcastic cynicism and heartless pessimism start to make sense to you. Does, does it not? 
We're like, oh, yeah. But when I went to the Midwest, I lived in the Midwest for about three years. And while I was out there, and everyone looked at me, they're like, that guy needs some Valium. I was like, no, 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 I'm just from Seattle. Uh, that's what it is. Like, I don't need any medication. I'm okay. I'm from Seattle, and that's who I am, right? Or say you're driving out here on the highway, and someone cuts you off really quick, and the weird thing is they're honking at you while they're cutting you off. You're like, I didn't do anything. And then you look, and you're like, oh, New York. They're from New York. Of course. They're honking at me while they're cutting me off. That totally makes sense to me, right? There's something about knowing the history of someone that kind of fills in some of the blanks for us. Please note, as I'm jumping into Genesis 12 today, that I'm going to refer to Abram as Abraham and Abram throughout the next few chapters. His name changes, but the New Testament refers to him pretty consistently as Abraham. In fact, I think 100% of the time it does it as Abraham. But you'll see the two names in here, same person, don't get confused. His name changes, and it changes purposeful, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. Two weeks ago in chapter 11, we learned a little bit about the history of Abraham and his story. It was a fall of humanity. Uh, uh, the project humanity in God's world has kind of, in our minds as the reader, has kind of turned into a little bit of a failure. You're looking at it and you're going, man, things aren't going the way they should be. I mean, God created all things. He created for human flourishing and then sin entered the world. And then after they restarted with Noah, that went bad. Noah wasn't quite as heroic as I thought he was. The guy was like naked in his tent, stunt, sort of, you know, kind of stupor drunk. And what's happening with him? And, and then you get up to Babel and they're building this tower for their own glory. And you're like, what is happening? This isn't turning out well. God had better things in mind. What's interesting is that Abraham is from Babel. That's where he lived. That's where his family was from. And he was living there during the time of the building of the Tower of Babel. What's interesting is that although he came from Babel originally, they went out from there and kind of traveled after the Lord scattered them. He went to Ur of the Chaldeans. The New Testament reminds us of that, which is part of Mesopotamia. It eventually becomes actually Babylon. And then he went to a place called Haran. And you could see some nomadic tendencies in his family as they're moving out after the scattering of Babel. And every single indication in both the text of the Bible and extra-biblical resources that we have tells us that Abram and his family were all pagans. They were all non-religious or irreligious, or probably that's not right. What we know of them is they worshipped many gods. They were polytheists is what they were. In fact, we learn in Joshua chapter 24 that Terah, Abraham's father, served other gods besides Yahweh. And a child who was reared in that family in the same way, in a culture that you take on the religion of your family, would have also been a polytheist as well. There's simply no way that we understand Abraham, Abraham as worshiping God when he chooses him in chapter 12 out of just the thin air. And it's an amazing story of calling. Perhaps there was something like personally commendable to from of Abraham to God, but if so, Genesis doesn't tell us anything. It just introduces us to him after this table of nations thing shows up in chapter 11, and it's just like God calls him out of nowhere, picks him out of all the world, and says, I want you to be mine. You're going to follow my calling, and you're going to walk differently. And it's amazing if you think about this. Why? Because he wasn't some amazingly awesome Christian guy, if you want to use New Testament language. He wasn't doing everything he possibly could to seek out the Lord. And so the Lord says, man, you're doing great, Abraham. But I'll tell you what, I got something for you to do. You're going to be really important now because you've been really amazing now already. You know, It was something very different where God called him out of polytheism and called him into a life of following Yahweh, which is amazing. Abraham gets this, cra gets this crazy promise from God that God will bless him, and more than that, that he will make his name great by making him a blessing to the entire world. Blessed to be a blessing, as some commentators put it, which is an amazing story. Like Noah, Abraham found grace in the eyes of the Lord for no apparent reason except that he was living and God chose to choose him, which is great. In fact, it's an argument of the New Testament of God's sovereign choice, which is one of those things that, as Christians, you will wrestle with forever on what sovereign choice is and human responsibility. That's a whole rabbit trail we could walk on for days, and we'd still not have a great answer. But we see it in here that God chooses Abraham out of the midst of this life of paganism and polytheism and chooses him as a follower. Abraham is not blessed because he deserves it. Abraham is not blessed because he deserves it. We see here in the story we're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 12 when he is 75 years old. 
he's literally got almost nothing. He's got family with him, and he's got very little. As I said, he's been kind of nomadic in that time. But he's got no family, no children, no real land, no real riches. Moreover, there's this tragic irony of how the text sets up everything. Because I don't know if you know this, but Abram in Hebrew means father, is what it means. He's 75 years old, and he has no children at this point, right? But he's called father. All right, I don't know if you're 75 or above in here, but if, if you're 75 or above and you want to have more children, will you just show me your hand real quick, just for a second? Right. I'm 42. I ain't having more children, all right? I'm just saying. Amen. Can I get an amen, anyone? All right, amen. All right, that's a good thing. You don't know my children. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's what it is. But here's the thing. His name means father. He has no kids. And what's ironic is later on his name is changed to Abraham, which means father of many, which is crazy. There's this irony that shows up in the text of Genesis. And I imagine Abraham probably felt a little bit of the weight of even his name. Names mean something in the Bible. But the irony of him being called to that, and many years later we can sit here, and if you were raised in church, I bet you you could sing a song with me that's really famous, right? Father Abraham had many sons. Yeah, many sons. Everyone sang it first gathering, too, and it was amazing. I was like, wow, you guys are good at this. If you don't know that, it's okay. You just weren't raised in Sunday school. We still love you. And you get to be part of the Abrahamic blessing today as well, which is awesome. But here in Genesis 12, in the first few verses, we're going to read the first nine verses here, and we're going to see what God does. I've set this whole thing up to give you a picture of what happens in the initial calling of Abraham, and I think it's going to apply to us before we leave today as well. So let's read these verses and see what the Lord's going to say to us here. It says this, Genesis 12, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you, of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At the time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, to what appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord, and he called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. Here's the initial calling of Abram, Abram, Abraham, that we learn about, where God calls him from his background, from all his baggage, from his polytheism, and calls him out to follow Yahweh. And it's a pretty amazing story in that scripture alone, just to think that God would call him. Now, we're supposed to cover Genesis 12 and 14 today. There's no way in the world that we could even possibly cover all those. But I do want to give you a couple highlights of what happens next, because it'll make sense when we talk more about this calling in just a second of why I'm highlighting this. Because after this calling, what we find out is Abraham moves with his family and ends up in Bethel. There's this huge famine at this point in the land that takes part. So Abraham takes his family from Bethel, which is where the land that God was kind of calling to, and he goes to Egypt. Because Egypt was somehow a bit immune to the famine that was going on. Now, before he gets there, Abraham does something exceedingly weird. He tells his wife, Sarai, that because she's so beautiful, that when the Egyptians see her, they will kill him and take her. So he says to her, will you tell the Egyptians that you're my sister instead? So for some reason, I don't know why. Any of you wives that do this, I have no idea why. Maybe you're just being really kind to your husband. This is craziness. Sarah agrees to this whole thing. So she goes there. The Egyptians see her. They think she's super beautiful. And the princes of Pharaoh tell Pharaoh about her. So Pharaoh takes her into his own house, is what the Bible says in Genesis 12, 15. This is code language for into his harem, which is no bueno, right? No bueno here. He's She's married. She's... Yeah, anyway, it's just a mess here if you think about this. Pharaoh, because of her and the supposed family connection with Abram, makes Abram rich. Starts giving Abram all this stuff, land and, and supplies and 
flocks and all and money and all this stuff that makes Abram rich. But here's the unique thing. The Lord afflicts Pharaoh and his house with plagues because of Sarah. Pharaoh figures out what's happening somehow, so he banishes Abram and his crew out of Egypt. And what's really unique here is Abram takes everything that he gained from Egypt, and he bolts out of Egypt and goes to settle back in the land. Which is really interesting if you're a biblical theological nerd, because in just another book ahead of us here, you remember the whole Israelite nation actually plundered Egypt and then left Egypt as well with all of their goods. This happens again. Also, Jesus out of Egypt. There's this weird thing that keeps happening in this foreshadowing of what's going on here in the text. And that's just for you nerds. We can talk about that too, but we won't go there. So, Lot, Abram's nephew, comes with him. Again, he's also rich because Abram had given all this money and kind of helped him along the way. And they had so much stuff, so many flocks, so much in their parties that they couldn't live together. There was not enough land that would support them. So they have this meeting. They talk about it together. And Abraham says to Lot, hey, we got too much stuff. You choose a land where you're going to go to, and I'll choose my land. You choose first. So Lot looks out there, and he sees in the distance there's this beautiful land. It's towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and it looks amazing. And he says, that's where I'm going, you know, because that's what nephews do, younger nephews do, I guess. They take things. And so they go out there, and he settles there, and Abraham goes this way and does his own thing with his own flocks and all of his money. And the interesting thing is in Genesis 13, verses 14 through 17, the Lord says to Abraham that he's going to give land to him and to his offspring forever. And so even though Lot got the better land, Abraham actually takes the land in the end. So Abraham puts his tents up near this place called the Oaks of Mamre at Hebron, and he builds an altar to the Lord. Now in chapter 14, Lot gets in big time trouble. We find out that there's this war that happens And these kings come in, and Sodom and Gomorrah and the kings that were there, they all fight together. Lot gets kind of caught up in this mess. It's a really unique story. The kings of Sodom and Gomorrah are in the fight. Evidently, they're fleeing or something happens, but they fall in these bitumen pits and die, which is crazy, kind of a weird story there as well. But then these other kings take Lot and all his possessions, and they run away. They, like, take them captive, and they take them with them. Abraham hears this, and so he grabs about 300 men and says, we're going to go take Lot back. We're going to care for him. So they go, they grab Lot, they take over these men, they take them back to the promised land once again. And then Lot goes in and still ends up further along in this thing to be back towards Sodom and Gomorrah, which sets up chapters 18 and 19. At the very end of this thing, Abraham has this weird experience with a guy named Melchizedek who shows up. We know he's the king of, he's from Jerusalem, he's a king. He blesses Abraham. Abraham gives him a tenth of everything as a customary thing to those who are more honorable than they are, or a priest, or a religious person, or a king. Abraham does that. And you get this weird story that shows up there, and you've got to read about Melchizedek sometime in Hebrews. It's a really crazy story, and it kind of shows us a little bit about what Abraham's thinking, and, and, uh, and, the, and the piece of kingship, and priesthood, and all that kind of stuff that shows up there. But this sets us up for where we're at today, and what happens is initial call. Because if you see anything from this whole little thing that I just recapped for you, is that this initial calling in verses 12, 1 through 9, or chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, is everything's in jeopardy from the very start of the calling. You see that? It's crazy. I mean, the Lord calls him out of nowhere, out of just being on his own, calls to him, and then everything in that moment is in jeopardy for what God had originally called Abram to do. The history is important. The storyline is important because it helps us understand how important this calling was to Abraham. And not for Abraham's sake, but for God's promises to continue to come true. That God will be prom- he would fulfill his word to Abraham. Not that Abraham's going to do all these amazing things. Because I don't know about you, but telling my wife to tell someone else that they're my sister is not a good thing. And Abraham's going to be the one that makes these mistakes along the way. Yet what happens? God is faithful to the calling that he has on Abraham. Now, I just have to pause for a second and just think about that. Like, how much good news is that for us today? Like, how many of us in here have heard the calling of God? We've been walking down the road following God, and and we see something in the distance, and we step off the road of the calling of God, do our own thing, make our own mistake, walk our own trail, if you will. 
How many of us have done that? Like, that should be every single one of our hands in here. Yes, I've done my own thing. Yes, my heart has chased after idols. Yes, I've tried to make a name for myself. Yes, I've been prideful. Yes, I've been lustful. Yes, I've been, I've seen all these things. God called me to this, and I find myself doing all of these things. What we learn right off the bat from Abram is that God is faithful to that initial call and that he has for us. And for you today as well. If God called you, and I believe he did, and I'll explain that more in just a second, then God will be faithful in that calling in your life. Yeah, you might make mistakes. You might blow it. You might take a detour. I certainly hope you don't tell your wife to tell someone else she's your sister, all right? But you might do something similar where you go, I've totally blown it in this way. And the Lord, is he going to be faithful? The Abraham story says exceedingly faithful. He will always be faithful to us in his call. And that is so important. I want you to personalize the calling of Abraham in a way that helps you think of the calling of God on your life this morning, to use him as an example of faith. Now, let me just say, I despise preaching that is the moral of the story preaching. And I could go off about this for a while, I won't. But what this means is that we sometimes hear preaching where we hear this moral of the story and then we walk away. It's kind of like, oh, I should be like that or I should do this thing. And it's kind of something inside me that I absolutely despise. You could talk to me more about the preaching philosophy at some point. It's a wonderful discussion. It makes me excited. But here's the thing about this. In Abraham's life, I actually want us to look at him this morning for just the next few minutes as an example of faith. And you might say to me, yeah, but he blew it. Yeah, he he died it. Just like you. (laughs) Just like me. He might have blown it, but we can still see him as an example of faith, as one who believed in the promises of God because God was going to be faithful to be fulfilling those promises that he gave. Now, the reason I can do this is because the New Testament does it. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11 real quick if you have your Bibles. In Hebrews chapter 11, we get the famous hall of fame of faith of Christians and followers of Christ using New Testament lingo here. For those who have walked with God, many who didn't see the promises of God fulfilled, and many who made horrible and grave mistakes in their lives. Abraham is one that shows up here as a shining example of one who obeys the Lord. And it's an amazing thing for us to think about this. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I'm just saying. You've got you gotta to buckle down for just a second, put your seatbelt on, get through Hebrews 11, and then I'll tell you more about that calling. But let's see what the Lord says in this Hall of Fame chapter about Abraham's life. In verse 8 it says this, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, him as good as dead. Isn't that funny, by the way? I'm only 75. I'm not good as dead. You know? Him as good as dead. We're born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. What do we learn in this scripture here? A big idea we learn this. Abraham and Sarah are examples to us of listening to a calling and obeying the calling of God, no matter what the circumstances look like, and even if they don't understand it. This is pretty amazing as you think about their lives. And if you know more of the story of Abraham and Sarah, it gets more complicated. In fact, as you get up to chapter 20, you read about this whole sister-wife thing again, and you're like, did I read this already? What's going on here? Because Abraham makes the very same mistake. It's crazy as we think about this. The calling of God in our lives and the response of obedience is what made Abraham righteous here. And it turned his entire life around. The calling of God from polytheism, from following his own thing, from doing his own way, into a new calling that God had for him is the thing that links him to righteousness. If you don't believe me, we'll see this next week in Genesis 15, verse 6, where Abraham believes the Lord and is credited to him as righteousness. 
after our, one of our gatherings a couple weeks ago, maybe three or four weeks ago, someone came up to me and asked me a question, which I believe is a really, really good question. They asked about the correlation between faith and obedience. What's the difference between faith and obedience? Can I believe and not do things? Well, how, how does this work out exactly? I'm like, that is a beautiful question. It is a very difficult question. I always answer that faith and obedience are two sides of the same coin. It's the same thing. It's part of that. But I also think about it in terms of this because I look at Abraham's life and I say, he was righteous? But, uh, you know, I, if I'm comparing myself to him, I'm doing okay at the moment, you know. But then I look at my life and I go, well, I'm, I'm not quite doing okay as well. I'm, what's happening? And I always ask myself the question, how is my obedience playing out? How is it working? Why am I obedient? Do I believe the Lord that's enough, or do I have to take the next step in my life? And I would say the complicated answer to that is yes. Something about faith requires a response from you, a stepping out of where you're at now to what is next. Now you say, come on, Pastor, you just said that it was not about faith and it's not grace and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, but I'm telling you that faith is about taking a step and responding in some way. Would the Lord have saved Abraham if he would not have stepped out of his place that he was at? I don't know. It doesn't give us the text in there, but it surely clearly says something about this in Hebrews where it says that he obeyed when he was called to go. Hebrews 11, 6, right? 11, 6, 11, 8. He, he, the Lord called Abraham so he got up and moved. Here's the thing. Faith is responding to the calling that God has on your life. This is why it's always connected to obedience. In fact, I even believe this. Believe, believing in God, is an act of obedience. Cognizantly, to you, for you to believe in God, that's an act of obedience. The Lord claims, ask us to believe in Him, believe in His promises. And for you to do that today, even cognitively, is an act of obedience. Now, it takes the next step, which I think is... You know, like Abraham stepping out of our comfort zone, stepping out of our life that we're living, stepping out in a way that God is calling us to. But there's something about believing that also links to faith here as well. It always requires response. So I can't give you the great answer of how to connect faith and obedience. I can tell you to read the book of James and see what you say after you get done reading that and wrestling with some of the ideas in there. But I can tell you it does require something of you. Just like Abraham God's calling for you today requires response from you today. Today, God wants to call you, and he wants you to receive that calling and live differently. You might say to me, dude, I don't have a calling like Abraham did. Hogwash, right? Hogwash. The Lord called you when you were living your own life, doing your own thing. He called you out of darkness, the Bible says, into his marvelous light. He called you. If you're a Christian in here today and you've responded to the good news of the grace of Jesus who died on the cross for our sins, resurrected them to new life, and offered us eternal life, and you responded to that hope today, you have a calling. You've responded to that. And your calling continues from the time you say yes to Christ to the time that you see him face to face and that your faith is made sight. I can't imagine Abraham living this life of faith. Now, the calling for us even goes further. Because it's not just an initial calling to follow God, but it's this continuous calling to follow God. Abraham had to take next steps all the way through in the promised land journey, if you will. I mean, if you think about the crisis that he would face, his first thing that happens after the Lord calls him is he ends up in Egypt. Like, this isn't where I'm supposed to be. This is the land I'm called to be. Can you imagine him sitting in his tents, like, going, what am I, what am I doing right now? Everything's in jeopardy of that calling. But the Lord had to continue calling over and over again. Now, if you're like me, The interesting thing is I think if you wonder what your calling is like, and if you ask yourself, like, what is my calling? Is it different than Abraham's? You might ask me that question. You might even think about that this morning as you're thinking about calling. Callings look very different in the Bible. Many of them are amazing and exciting, and some of them are just kind of normal. Like you think about Moses' calling, which was to come up to the mountain and see a great sight, where the Lord showed up to Moses. He got to see him and speak to him as, as a person speaks to their friend. That's just amazing. So much so that his face was shining when he'd come back down from the mountain. Super cold. Like, wow, that's amazing. That's awesome. I want that mountain. I want to experience that moment, right? There's Paul being knocked back on, on the road to, to in Acts chapter 9, where he sees this great light, and he just the Lord shows up and calls him out of his own life. But then there's Jesus, right, who just turns to a group of fishermen, kind of rugged guys that, kind of probably lived their own lives, did their own things, maybe a little bit like Abram, 
where they weren't quite following the Lord. And he says, hey, guys, put your nets down. Come follow me. Come follow me. Nothing really Shekinah glory about that, if you will. Nothing really Abrahamic about that, where all of a sudden the Lord comes down and calls to him in some miraculous way. And yet the disciples follow the Lord. You get the disciples in the early days of the church just preaching to normal people on the streets and cities and villages, living out their days, and they just say, repent, repent, that calling of God. And what do the people do? They repent, and they start following the Lord. I love that there's amazing stories in the Bible of extraordinary callings that some of us indeed have heard in here. We've had that amazing moment. You went to that conference. You experienced that camp high. You went to a Billy Graham thing years ago. You, whatever, fill in the blank. You had that high experience. But some of us have been walking this road just kind of faithfully along the way, and at some point the Lord has made himself real to you. And you said, I'm in. I want to follow that. I want to follow the Lord. It's all extraordinary. Why? Because God calls us out of where we were in the darkness of our lives and calls us into something new. And that's the hope of the gospel. The beauty is in Abraham's life, not living the life he should, but the Lord calls him and he takes those next steps. And that is so beautiful. And it's a calling that I want to replicate in each of our lives. We need that personal call from God. So in some ways, as we put ourselves in the shoes of Abraham or the sandals of Abraham this morning, I want you to ask yourself a couple questions. How do you know if you've been called? And what is the cost of that calling for you? Well, how do you know if you've been called? First of all, remember it's not about you. Personal calling is not for your own glory. It's for Christ's glory. It's for his plan. It's not because you've done something awesome that God can't help to choose you. All right? I think the picture of Abraham should give us much hope, especially when he shows up in the, in the Hebrews Hall of Fame. And you go, oh, man, I'm, I'm kind of understanding. Like, I can be a part of this too. Maybe Genesis doesn't want us to think of the question if Abraham went wrong as being the important one or not. Maybe the question more, and I think for Western readers, we get all confused by that because we make assumptions about the Bible's purposes. We often think it exists to tell us how we are to live and that stories provide illustrations of right and wrong and how we're supposed to choose that, which, granted, the Bible does tell us how to live, but the stories in there maybe don't point to the right and wrong as much as they do to a faithful God who's always faithful to his promises and always doing the right thing for his glory and for his plan. And our response is to continually respond to that and say, I'm there. Lord, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to seek your glory. It's why we always say around here that we want to make much of Jesus Christ around here. It's our calling as a church community. So I'm not saying, it's, it, it's, you can say it to me, I don't think it's right that Abraham gave his wife to Pharaoh as a sister, you know, in the household, the harem, and all that kind of stuff. I'm with you, all right. I'm 100% with you, all right. But what if that's not the point? What if it's actually to get us to a bigger point of realizing how amazing it is that God would be faithful to his promises? It's the same with you. God will be faithful to his promises to you. If you've walked a path that is completely one of destruction and pain and suffering, and your dumb decisions have caused effects in your life over and over again, here's the good news. You are a son of Abraham. You're a daughter of Abraham. You can receive God's hope and your future, and it can be bright. It can be incredibly bright. I'm so grateful for that. It's why I can receive this calling and I can trust in the Lord just like Abraham did. And I can say, man, God's calling is for me too. I have a saying, God's calling happens not because of you. God's calling happens in spite of you, all right? God's calling happens not because of you. God's calling happens in spite of you, all right? I tell people sometimes when they ask about Imprint Church, and I was planning this seven years ago now, and I always say, yeah, it's, it's a miracle. It all was in spite of what I did. God's been gracious and faithful over and over. And I don't say that just as a, a throw it out for everyone. I truly mean it. God has been faithful and everything he's done has happened in spite of me. Have I partnered with him in the ministry that he's done? Absolutely. But many times I've seen that he has been more faithful to his promises than I could ever, ever even comprehend. That's how you know that God is calling you. Yes, he is. He's calling you this morning. If you've not received the initial call of God, you can follow Jesus this morning. You can say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to receive the good news of the of the death of resurrection, or death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who died in my place and rose again into new life, so I can receive that new call. Know that it's going to cost you. Know that it's going to cost you. Think about the things it cost to Abraham, real quick. And as I think about kind of winding this sermon down, I want to think about the cost of the call. We're going to respond to the Lord in just a second here. We're going to think about the cost of God's calling in our own life. 
See, the personal call of God for Abraham disrupted his life with comfort and complacency and it replaced it with a, li- a life of unknowns. I mean, Abraham didn't know. Hey, Abraham, go to a place where I'm showing you. Any more details? I got Google Maps on my phone. I could actually put it in there, Lord. I can, I, I can go where you want me to go. Go to where I show you. Still need some help, Lord. Just get up. Just move. Just move. It pulled him out of this life of being able to control everything that he had to be a life of complete, out of control, trusting in the Lord. This is one of the interesting things. To know that you've been called by God is a good question to ask yourself. What is the cost of that calling? Is to ask you, is your life one of complete comfort and stability? Or is there some unknowns out there? Is there things that that if God doesn't come through, everything's going to fall apart? Because if there's not, are you really following the Lord? It's a really good question to ask ourselves. And I wrestle this as a fairly wealthy American, right? Think about this. We have everything we need, except last week when everyone bought everything from every store. We have everything we need, right? But I wrestle with this because I'm thinking to myself, man, if, if I, I want to live my life in such a way that if the Lord doesn't go through, the whole floor is going to fall out. Have you ever felt that before? you ever wanted that life of unknowns and callings? And we live in this world. I try for security. And I think it's wise. I try to put money in retirement. I try to save some money for my kids' college education and all that kind of stuff. But I know that I have things that I can easily fall back on if the walls, if the wheels fall off, if you will. But what if the calling of God is different for us? There's a cost to it. And that cost is if I take a step out and the Lord doesn't come through, I'm going to splash down into chaos. What if that's the calling of God in our lives? I just can imagine the Lord's. You know, Abraham saying, I don't know where to go. Lord. I, don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. And the Lord says, I know. Just go. You know, the thing else that Abraham does in this is that he leaves his old life behind. It's a really interesting thing about his, as I told you, God calls him out of darkness, out of polytheism, paganism, and he requires him to go to a different lifestyle, a different way of worshiping, and a different God altogether in this way. A calling means a, a separation for him. If you go back to verse 1 in chapter 12, you see it where he says, leave, get up and go. And he also says, leave your kindred and your father's house. All right. What he's saying, this kind of code in the ancient Near Eastern world, to think about this. The call of God means you're leaving a culture. You're leaving a religious system behind. You're leaving idols behind. You're leaving all of that behind to follow God in a new way. And when he says, leave your kindred, it means all the stuff you've known all the ways you've been raised, the polytheism you've been raised in, and follow Yahweh. Some of us have to do that in our lives, where we come from a very pagan, Christian, un, you know, non-Christian household. And we have to leave those patterns behind and follow the Lord into a new calling and set new patterns and new examples for our own children going forward. Calling that God has for us requires a separation of attitudes, actions, sometimes ambitions that we have that surrounds us, and that we need to be a person that lives differently. You know what's insane about this story? I think about this. Is that Abraham, in this moment, as soon as he leaves this, he takes off. As soon as he hears the response, the call of God, he leaves, 75 years old, 600 miles away. So it's like going from here ready, if you will. And he settles at the Oak of Moray at Shechem, near Shechem, in the Promised Land, in verse 6, is what we see there. Why? Commentators note this is one of the main places the Canaanite world would worship. It's the centerpiece of all worship for them. Did you see in the text what he did here? He builds an altar. He builds an altar and kind of plants his flag in the ground and says, I'm going to be a Yahweh worshiper. I'm going to worship the true Lord right in the center of all Canaanite religion. It's almost like he's left everything that he had behind to follow the Lord in reckless abandon. And this is an amazing picture. This is like us going to Hollywood and saying, God is the only one we should worship, and he defines our identity, he defines our culture, he defines our everything about us. This is like doing that. Or going to Wall Street and saying, God is the owner of all things. You don't own anything. We're just stewards of everything he's given to us. But make it personal as well. It's like looking head on at the idols of our own lives and saying, the Lord is better. Jesus is better than my view of sex, money, and power. And he's better than these things. When we receive this call, it changes us. There's no way around this. And it causes us to leave behind a lifestyle that we once lived and to live a different lifestyle. It's a calling. It's that piece of obedience. And finally today, as we close, the third thing that we see here that Abraham is called to is this life of mission. And it's beautiful. 
This is why Abraham is blessed to be a blessing. That through him, the entire Jewish nation would be raised up to be worshipers of Yahweh, called to be worshipers of Yahweh. And through that, you and I get the benefit of this as Gentiles. Later on, to hear of the hope of Jesus Christ, who was born the son of Abraham, the son of one who was to be the blessed one altogether, to pass that blessing on to us as well. And what happens in this way? Like, we learn here that Abraham's life was bigger than just himself. He was called and commissioned to live a life of mission. That's what happens here. And this is an amazing piece of our story as well. If you've received the calling of God, and you've left behind the things, the idols, the things that have, that have easily entangled you, what does it call you to? The Great Commission. It's exactly what Jesus told the disciples to be salt and light, to go out in the world, to be different, and yet be a light to them, to be a blessing to them. God's call on your life is to use you in a life of mission. And we share in the calling of Abraham to be a blessing to our world. Jesus said in John 15, 7 and 8, and verse 16, he says this, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for, done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. You did not choose me, but I chose you, that you would go and bring forth fruit. And by this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. God chose you to make you a blessing, an eternal blessing to someone. You've got to know that. This is part of your calling. I even love this picture where we think of this and we say, man, God chose me out of all these people. That kind of reminds me of Abraham. Well, it's supposed to. This is the way that God works. It's the way he chooses us in our response to live a lifestyle of blessing, to call our hearts to mission. So wherever you're at, whatever your family's like, whatever road you've taken that is not towards the Lord, he's still calling you to go back to this of calling and follow him in that life of mission. Calling for us is never going to be comfortable, but it's going to be different for us to live that way, to be obedient as God has called us in that call. Tim Keller has a helpful little book that I got to read because it's Apocalypse last week. Freedom, self-forgetfulness is what it says. It's based on the sermon that he gave, and I love it. I wanted to read a quote from you as I kind of close this morning. He says this, You'll never be as happy as you can be. You'll never have the kind of joy that you were made for until you hear the call of God and embrace your mission to the point of personal loss. He goes on to say, How do we know that's true? It's true because in John chapter 17, Jesus was praying his prayer before he goes to the cross. But in verse 18, he said, Father, as you've sent me into the world, so I now send them. And a few verses later, what does it say? I am saying all of this that they might have my fullness of joy, or how my Bible says it, so that their joy will be complete. Which means that being on mission to the point of personal loss is the actual key to being happy in life. You want to be happy? Follow Christ's calling on your life in that life of mission. Go out and live your life differently. Follow the Abrahamic call here to be a blessing to the world around you. Jesus uses the same words when he says to the disciples, Go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. This is the hope that we have as Christians this morning. We get a chance to respond. And uh, my hope for you this morning is that you've heard the calling of God in your life. And even as we've looked at Abraham here and you get a chance to sing, our band's going to come up here and we're going to sing some songs. As we do this, you get a chance to kind of think about these words, think about your personal call, ask the Lord to clarify, clarify it for you, and then ask him to make it real for you as you worship. So as we sing these songs, you're welcome to come forward and receive communion. There's tables in the front. You can come forward and take, take that bread and dip that in the cup. It's all gluten-free here, so if you need that, it's available at both sides. You receive communion at the tables, at your seat, or anywhere around here if you'd like to, as a way to claim the Lord's death until he comes, the Bible says. And that's a great way to respond to the Lord this morning. There's also baskets up front. You can come and give as an act of worship. And you're welcome to give at any point during these songs. You can also pray, spend some time praying, and I'm just asking the Lord to clarify your mission and to thank the Lord for this, this mission that he's given to all followers of Christ that we see exampled in Father Abraham and that we can take to our own life today as well. You can pray and ask the Lord to make that real. If you need prayer for anything, there's people who have tags on it. They'd be willing to pray for you. If you need prayer for something, personal calling, something you told you, maybe the sermon did not connect with you today. You're like, I have something else on my mind. You can pray with them about that as well. That's great. You can go back and pray with them.
Let me close this reminder. Before we go on a mission for God, before Abram could go on this mission for God, we have to know that God has been in a mission for us since the beginning of time. And the true son of Abraham, as I said, not born of barren women, woman, but born of a virgin, came into this world with the harshest of missions and the most ultimate mission to enter into a world of darkness, to crush death, to kill sin forever. And he did it for me and for you. He came to lose everything. He was so full of loss and loneliness, and yet he was so full of joy at the very same time. The Bible tells us that he was the loneliest and most joyful man that has ever lived, because his ultimate loss at the same time was our ultimate gain. In Christ, we can be people who have this calling, receive it by faith. Jesus Christ died for our sins and conquered death, so you can wake up and hear this call of God. And when we hear the Savior speak, we can know that it is our Savior and we could indeed respond to this one. So let's sing. Let's pray. Let's take communion. Let's give. And thank the Lord for his call. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. I'm grateful to get a chance to just dive into it together, Lord. I would pray you'd help us now to receive this as our own. But it's amazing how Hebrews gives us a picture of Abraham as an example, a father of our faith. And I think that's purposeful so we can actually see our own lives in this, Lord. And and I would pray, if a person in here has not received the ultimate call of Christ to follow you, that this morning would be that day of salvation, that they would say yes to you. And Lord, I pray this would be a time for us to respond to you in a way that, Lord, when you speak, Lord, that we would be willing and, and obedient to you to leave behind our old life and walk out in a newness of life, Lord. And so, Lord, give us the ability to do that today. Thank you for your calling. Thank you for your promises. I'm grateful for this time. May you meet us now as we worship. In Jesus' name.